All right, so the next thing to talk about specifically, uh, hormones need a couple of things to, to be made. Um, and this is where, again, it, just going by the numbers can have some pretty dramatic effects on your body. Two things that your body has to have to make hormones, if you need more serotonin, if you need more leptin to burn fat, if you need more of anything, the two things that, that almost every hormone needs to be produced is cholesterol and fat. And then vitamin D is the precursor to, to make most of these. So if you're eating a very low-fat diet, if you're taking a cholesterol drug to knock your cholesterol down to 150 or 130 or whatever, you know, this extreme number is because the lower your cholesterol, the lower your heart disease risk, you can throw off all these other hormones in your body and you can have a lot of long-term effects. So remember, the reason your body makes cholesterol, it's not even that you consume it most of the time in food. Most of cholesterol is made by your liver. So it's your body regulating what you're doing. So if, if you start taking a medication to lower cholesterol abnormally, you could be throwing off what your body's natural trying to do to heal and function normally. Does that make sense to everybody? So you take a pill to get a number, and yet your body's naturally trying to make a certain thing. So, you, so if, you're, if your fatty acid ratio is off, that's another thing that can cause um, these insulin things to be off, or any of these hormones, but insulin's one of them. So two things, you don't necessarily need to take a supplement to get enough healthy fats, but the healthy fat that most people miss are omega-3s. Most people get enough omega-6s. You can get it from olive oil, you can get it from um, nuts, you can get, well, even people that are eating healthy get enough omega-6s in most cases. The one that, that a lot of people don't get enough of is omega-3s. Now omega-3s are anti-inflammatory. So it turns out they prevent heart disease, they lower the inflammation in your body, they, they can help with, um, again, with mood, they can do all these different things. So if you're, if you're not eating a healthy type of fish at least two to three times a week, you should probably be supplementing. Or if you're not getting a huge amount of flaxseed or some of the other things that have high levels of omega-3. Um, one thing that can work if, you're not, if you don't love fish, another thing that works really well is you can get flax oil and you can put it right in your smoothie make smoothies in the morning, you typically don't taste very much of it, and it's a good way to get a balance of healthy omega-6s and omega-3s at a pretty good price. Um, but if you don't like to eat fish, you don't like the taste, you don't like to cook it, whatever it might be, if you don't do either of those things, you should really be taking an omega supplement. Otherwise, you're, gonna, you're probably going to have these ratios be off. So the three things, we're not going to cover foods tonight at all. Um, because most of the time, most of you have already been to the recipe night, or you've been to another talk. If you, if you're, if this is your first event, uh, please sign up to come to our next one when we have that in later in July, and we'll be covering more food specifically. Um, but the three things to look at, if you're looking to make changes, again, one is the healthy fats. To make the hormones that you need, you want to have the right types of fats. The second thing, talking about carbs, the more you get away from simple sugars and simple carbs the more your body's going to make the right types of hormones. And then lastly, proteins. Really, proteins don't play as much of a factor specifically in hormones, but what you get from protein sources, you're going to get the healthy or unhealthy fats, depending on if you're eating grass-fed meat versus conventional, um, if you're eating the right kinds of chickens, if you're eating. The one thing that protein does have, though, is the chemicals. So if you're not eating, if you're not getting um, chicken that hasn't been fed full of um, antibiotics and steroids and these things, those can be, your, if you're consuming them, if the chicken consumed them, you're consuming them. If the turkey consumed it, you're consuming it. If it's a processed meat like sausage or hot dogs or these different things, those are going to throw your hormones off as well. So you want to consider that with protein, getting that highest quality and specifically that's where you should spend your money first. If you need ideas for this, uh, most of the people in here already come in and get adjusted and so you have that cruise ship or nursing home book which has got a ton of things for recipes, it's got a bunch of different options. But another book, if you haven't tried it yet, is this nutrition book. Um, if you look at ours, in my house it's stained, it's, it's rough, it's like our fourth book too. I mean, it's, it's just awesome as far as recipes and, and applicable steps for what you can use. Now, one of the most popular things that a lot of people I think came for is thyroid. A lot of people have issues with their thyroid. Now, here, here's one thing that I have to say. First of all, um, this talk tonight is, although it might, like I said, it's a lot of information, it's pretty simplistic compared to how much there is to even try and absorb about hormones. They are a very, very in-depth topic. 
but you know if you do need if you have a thyroid issue there's a couple of basic things that you can do um, one thing is to exercise which we're going to cover in a few minutes another thing is to detox Thyro the thyroid gland specifically is one of the most sensitive things to chemical toxicity so if you're if you're feeling sluggish if you're resistant if you have weight loss resistance or whatever it might be detoxing is essential for thyroid function it's one, it's one of the biggest things for that hormone specifically um, but if you know if you're if you've ever taken a um, thyroid medication or maybe you're on a thyroid medication there recently there have been a lot of advancements in how they can test for thyroid they can look at a lot more factors than normal and they also do have some um, they have some natural thyroid medicine. So there, there are certain things that you can do much more naturally versus being on um, thyroxin for your entire life or, or, or an alternative to that. If you can imagine this, you know, thyroxin, which is the most commonly prescribed drug for hypothyroidism, you know when that was developed? 1926. So it's been a drug that's been in existence for almost 90 years. Um, so there, you know, when you think about that, it's a synthetic drug, which means if it's synthetic and you take it over a really long period of time, it's going to have side effects. It's going to, it's not going to work in your body the way that it should long term. But there is somebody that's really, really good at thyroid specifics. It's almost all that he does, and I know some of you go see him already. But his name's Dr. Boak, B-O-U-C. Dr. Boak um, is in South Beloit, and he's a, he's got a medical license, but he practices as natural as he possibly can. And his specialty is he only does thyroid and female hormones. That's it. So you, if you want somebody that can go into much more depth on this than I can, if you're trying to get off your medication and want to have a doctor lead you through that, or if you want to go more natural, um, you can Google his name. He's the one to go see. I read his first 20 reviews this morning. Um, I read through him. He, he had five stars from every single person that went to see him. So just saying that, I, I, I barely know him, um, but we use him. We send a lot of people to him um, for thyroid. But what, what happens with thyroid is, is most people know there's several different types of thyroid diseases or thyroid hormones. You can have underactive or overactive. But, um, but the three things that you look at with thyroid are T3, um, T4, and TSH, which TSH stands for thyroid stimulating hormone. And so if any one of these three are off, they can throw off your um, thyroid function. Now, one of the things and one of the reasons why synthetic thyroid medicine is uh, very hard to regulate, very hard to get to work really well, is that you could have your TSH and T3 working great, but you could have a problem with your body converting over into T4 or vice versa. So you could have just one bridge um, out of all these different hormones or, um, or stimulating hormones you could just have one small thing off and you could be completely um, thrown off. You could have, you could feel sluggish, you could gain a bunch of weight, you could, you could have your hair fall out, you can, you can have a lot of very serious things if even a small thing is off with your thyroid. So it's a general basic thing. If you're having thyroid issues, you really want to detox. If you've, if you've never heard me talk about detoxing before, the way to detox, you want to do um, the cell and body detox for two to three months and then most people do more of a maintenance schedule. So you do two to three months to fully detox everything out. And then um, I personally just take detox on Sundays. So I, it's an easy way for me to remember. So instead of a box lasting a month, then a box lasts seven months. And that's how I, I prefer to maintain it. Other people don't like to do the weekly thing, so they may just do one box once a year or twice a year or something like that. And again, it's, it's not for every person, but if thyroid specifically is one of your things, you may need to detox. You may need to get your body working better toxicity-wise. Next thing, serotonin. Serotonin is your, your feel-good hormone. It's what regulates your mood, anxiety, depression, these things specifically. Now, serotonin um, has a couple of things. I, you know, it's, it's, well, I guess it's the first of June, but yet with all the rain and cold, I bet people have still been inside. A few of us, anyway. I'm not tough enough. Uh, but, you know, the thing about it is is that, that serotonin needs, needs these things um, just like we talked about with some of the other hormones, you need cholesterol, you need healthy fats, and you need vitamin D. Well, for most of us that live in northern Illinois or live in Rockford, if, you're, if you sat inside all winter, you may get depleted in vitamin D and you might not be able to make enough serotonin. 
Does anybody ever feel those those seasonal blues, the February um, seasonal affective disorder? I think they call it. One of the big things for that is if you don't, if your body's not producing enough serotonin. Um, serotonin is also regulated by your brainstem, so the amount of serotonin you release is specifically linked to how well your your brainstem or your thermostat is regulating your body. Um, beyond that, so if you're missing either of those things, you know you should really be. Um, focused on that, get outside, get some sun, or take vitamin D. But lastly, here's the hardest part for those that are on an antidepressant or have been in the past, is that um, SSRIs, which is the most commonly prescribed antidepressant, what that stands for is, is serotonin reuptake inhibitor. And so what happens is, because your body is not making enough serotonin, they feel like, um, they, they give you this drug that stops the receptors, from taking the serotonin back out of your blood. So as your body's trying to regulate and you and you and you damage those receptors, inevitably it's your body's trying to do the right thing at the right time. Therefore, it it, it makes less serotonin. And then you take this drug and then the drug stops working, so you need more drug to keep less serotonin in your blood. Well, by the time you try and go off this medication, you're producing such a small amount of serotonin that think about what it's going to do when your body starts to take it out of your blood like it normally would. That's how people have such a hard time coming off that medication specifically. So if you are if you are on an antidepressant and you're trying to get off of it, if you're doing better, if you're getting healthier, um, there's a few things you can do for stimulating serotonin. One, one is, um, again, the short, intense exercise has been shown at least three days a week to be more effective. The other is to increase fat in your diet. One, one study that I really like showed that um, two handfuls of cashews every day and the healthy saturated fats in there will increase your serotonin levels about the same as one dose of an antidepressant. So again, it stimulates serotonin release, uh, but a lot of people are afraid to, uh, to eat it because of all the, the, all the fat in there. But the other thing is, if you are on one right now, that's one that you just can't go off cold turkey. You, your body, you're, it's a, it, well you can, but it's not a good idea. It's, it's much lower in success rate. So what you want to do is, if you're going to go off this over several weeks or even several months, you want to start taking a, a, a slightly smaller dose and then really up the amount of healthy fats that you're getting and you should really be taking um, a lot of vitamin D to help make more serotonin. So you take, this, you take the extra vitamin D to allow your body to produce more and then once you're doing fine at the slightly lower dose, you go to a slightly lower dose and you just slowly work your way off. You can certainly do that with the help of your doctor if they're open to going off that, but if you're looking at it or you're frustrated or trying to make a change or you're sick of having the higher and higher doses, that, that's one of the ways that you have to do that because those drugs essentially limit the amount of serotonin that your body will make. So a couple things about burst training or max T3. Um, as it relates to hormones, there, your body is going to make more cortisol with long distance exercise. It just does. So it's not saying that um, it's not saying that if you if you like to do that that you shouldn't. But if you're looking at this specifically from a health perspective, um, one example I can give you that, that's really close to me. I just I just saw him this weekend. A, a good friend of mine um, runs every day and lifts every day lifts weights every day, is very, very thin, very muscular, can run a ton, but he actually, um, at work, he, he lost a disc in his back. And so he had to slow down running. And over the course of the last four months, we worked through, cut the running half as many days and half as long, and kept the exact same weight training. And instead of gaining weight, which most people would think you'd do if you keep everything else the same, his body fat percentage went down by 4%, total muscle mass went up, you know, all these, because remember, if you're overdoing it, especially with long distance exercise, um, you can be creating some negative stress hormones in your body. So a couple of the general rules, one is that you only need to exercise for about six to 12 minutes at a very high rate. Specifically, and if you remember this formula, if you, if you don't have, if you've never written the formula down before, it's the number 220 minus your age, and then you multiply that by 80% and 90%. So 220 minus your age, times 80% and then times 90%. So what that will find is your target heart rate for the most effective balancing um, exercise. So you want to have that occur for 6 to 12 minutes in whatever type of workout you do. 
You might be a runner, but you should probably only run for 20 minutes or 30 minutes at the most. Running for more than that only has the negative effects. A um, couple other things about it. Short in exercise lowers cortisol, which again is a stress hormone. And the other thing that it does is it opens up your insulin receptors. So since we're talking about hormones, insulin specifically, um, the only time your insulin receptors are not uh, essential is right after exercise. Right after your exercise at a high intensity, you have these what are called, um, well, they're insulin channels, but they, they no longer need the insulin receptor to allow sugar into the cell. So for short, short, intense exercise, you can get sugar out of your blood and you can actually help somebody um, balance their insulin and raise their leptin. How many people read Dr. Alex's leptin newsletter last week? On the chairs? So maybe, okay, so maybe a third. So what leptin is, I've alluded to it a few times, leptin is the opposite. So insulin is for pulling sugar out of your blood. Leptin is for burning fat. So everybody in this room is predominantly a fat burner or predominantly a sugar burner. If you create too much insulin, if you're eating too much sugar or too many carbs, it, when your insulin levels go up, your leptin levels go down. And what happens when your leptin levels go down is you no longer burn fat when you're fasting, like when you're at night or in between meals. You don't burn fat as much, which makes you crave. If anybody has the craving for the mid-morning snack, for the afternoon, the crash, maybe after lunch, after a couple hours, those are all signs that your insulin levels are too high and your leptin levels are down. Leptin, le leptin allows you to feel satisfied. It allows you to know when you're full. If you've ever told, heard somebody say um, they have portion control, that's another reason that you can have portion control is if you don't have enough leptin, your body's not telling you that you're full. Another thing about that, since we're talking about feeling full, is if you're, if you're not eating nutrient-dense foods, your body will still crave until you get enough of the nutrient. So if you need a certain amount of magnesium, if you need a certain amount of water, if you need a certain amount of a vitamin, and you eat, let's say you go to McDonald's and you get a, a food that has high fat and high protein and high carbs, but it doesn't have much nutrition, your body's going to be hungry again very soon. Um, if you think about, you know, the average, I think the average extra value meal at McDonald's is close to 2,000 calories, and yet how many people feel full for more than a couple hours after they eat 2,000 calories? Not, not very long, right? And that's, that's the reason is because if you're not getting the vitamins, if you're not getting the minerals, your body will crave. That's also true uh, for women that are pregnant. If you've heard of a woman that has this crazy craving, you know, that, that's part of it. Their craving is craving a certain nutrient or a certain vitamin or a certain mineral and what that food has in it, even if it only has a small amount that their body inherently knows because they've had it. So a couple, couple things that way. Here's the other thing. This is the, the cheapest thing that you can do to balance your hormones. Get enough sleep. Now, there's a few things that I wanted to cover with sleep tonight because, you know, I think everybody knows that they should get enough sleep. That's, that's, nobody, that's not new information. But there's a few things that you can do to get better sleep. And that's what I'd like to talk about tonight. So getting better sleep, the less stimulation your body has, the better the quality of sleep that you can get. So what, you, what is essential in your sleep is how long you stay in what's called REM sleep. REM sleep is the deepest, most healing sleep that you have. Now, people will adapt. If you've known somebody that can go on four hours of sleep instead of eight or six instead, in many cases what's happened is their body, if they're, if they're really, really healthy, their body will create longer amounts of time that they're in REM. So the, the, the way sleep works is you go through a cycle of stage one, which is really light sleep. That's when it's easy to wake up. Stage two, stage three, stage four. REM is the deepest sleep. So if you've ever gotten to a point where you tried to wake somebody up or their alarm was going off and they weren't responding, they were probably in stage four or REM sleep. If you've ever remembered a dream, um, you were right in between. You dream in phase four and, or stage four in REM. You can remember dreams in phase four. You don't remember dreams in REM, typically. So when you wake up and you don't remember your dream, you're in that deepest level of sleep. So however long you stay in REM sleep, is, is what really allows your body to heal. It, most people are on average, it takes a two hour cycle to get from stage one all the way through REM and back out. So on average it takes about two hours. Now every person is different, but that's the average. Now a couple of the things that are an issue um, that people can do to throw off their hormones, um, one of those is, is a sleeping pill. 
So if you take if you take a sleeping pill, if you take Benadryl, if you take Tylenol PM, if you take these things to sleep, you might get eight or ten hours. But you know how people? I've heard so many people say this. I still wake up groggy. You ever heard somebody say that that's on a pill or taking Nyquil or something like that? Well, they don't get very much REM even though they sleep a long time. That drug doesn't allow their body to go to REM sleep. REM sleep's where you make these hormones, where they balance. So sleep is essential for that. But a couple, so when we talk about stimulation, the darker the room, the better it is. Um, the less noise that somebody can hear, the better it is. You know, certain things like, um, what ideally is just no noise, but white noise, or something that's not gonna startle or jolt your body back out of that deeper sleep as you're going through those cycles. Um, I've, I've enjoyed being woken out of REM sleep many times um, in the last year. My wife worse than me, I think, but um, you know, having a new baby, you ever know how tired new parents are? Well, they're not getting REM sleep, right? They're, if the baby wakes up and cries you know, every couple hours, you might not be through that same sleep cycle. Uh, but your body adapts and so you get longer REM. The other thing that's important for getting quality sleep is what you're sleeping on. So some people, I've had plenty of people come in and tell me that their bed or their pillow or something's thrown them off. So unfortunately, because if you, know, if you looked around the room tonight, we all have different body types. We're all different sizes. We all sleep differently. So here's a couple general rules for what you want to have um, when you're sleeping, starting with um, how you want to lay. So ideal, perfect is to sleep on your back, especially with your sleep rolls in. Here's your home care plan. <laughs> so ideal, that's perfect. The longer you can lay in your rolls, the more you're going to create curvatures, be balanced. Um, your side is not necessarily bad, but it, it's not as ideal as your back. Um, if you're sleeping on your side, one of the things that's different is you want to try and be in, is in a line as possible. So for those that are back sleepers, besides laying on a roll, you would want to have a much thinner pillow. So the thinner pillow to allow your head to come back and to be as neutral as you can. Uh, for those that sleep on their side, or predominantly on their side, you want a pillow about as thick as your shoulder. And that's about as thick as your shoulder once you've actually compressed it, once your head's laying on it. That's going to keep your, your spine in the best alignment, it's going to give you the best quality of sleep that you can have. Um, the, the density of the pillow, unfortunately there's no right pillow. Um, I always say if there was, we'd just sell it. we get everybody the right pillow, but it's, it's very difficult because everybody's different. When you talk about a mattress, um, in general, what you want to have is a mattress that's firm enough um, that when you lay on it, your, your head, your shoulder blades, and your butt would sink in just enough to touch the back of your low back if it was arched and the back of your neck. Um, if you feel like you're rolling into it, it's too soft. If you're sleeping on your side, you want a slightly softer mattress in general because you're gonna, your shoulder and your hip and your knees, are the, the points are smaller, so you're going to sink in a little bit more. So for those that already aren't in the market for a new bed, I'm not talking about that, but just so that you're aware of it, those are things that help you um, sleep better. And then for those that are stomach sleepers, I will tell you, it is possible to make the switch, but it does take a while. Um, and if for those that are stomach sleepers that absolutely cannot switch, if you lay a pillow at least across your, your shoulders and chest, the biggest problem with stomach sleeping is that you're jamming your head sideways. You never think about if you slept with your neck all the way twisted for six or eight or ten hours. Think about what that's going to do long term to the same area where your brain stem sits and controls all these things. So if you lay at least a pillow longer and you can get the straighter you can get your head, the better off you're going to be. So those are a few things about how to get better quality of sleep. But sleep has shown overwhelmingly to balance your hormones. Here, here's a good example. Um, for those people that have teenagers that have ever seen somebody really significantly gain weight, um, in high school, which is when you should still have a pretty strong metabolism. Um, there, there's a lot of factors to that, but they showed, um, they did a, this huge study that showed that um, kids of the same size, weight, average, all these things that got eight hours of sleep versus um, children and I guess teenagers that got six and a half hours or less, 150% increase in overweight or obese in the, in the group that got six and a half hours or less which is especially hard when school starts early, you know, when there's sports, when there's all these things, but sleep plays a factor in all your hormones and how your body regulates. So to go back here now, I want to go back all the way to the, to make sure we cover every hormone here, and then we're, we're basically finished.
Okay, so to cover this, for starters, estrogens, the way to prevent yourself from having these xenoestrogens is again to not have the chemicals absorb into your body and to not eat the processed foods. Testosterone, um, the, besides the sugar, that short, intense exercise is one of the best ways to increase your testosterone. For men and women need some testosterone. Progesterone um, is the one that we talked about the least. Progesterone is what they link to your estrogen levels, and it has all sorts of health benefits, but there, it's much more intricate. Cortisol um, is your stress hormone. So what cortisol does, again, going back to the uh, marathon runner, marathon runners have high cortisol. And they have high cortisol because they need to be able to keep their blood sugar high over a long period of time. So that's what cortisol does. But most of us don't get, don't run marathons. We have stress at work or at home or somewhere in that, and that's why our cortisol levels go up. So that's where getting proper sleep, extra short, intense exercise, um, those are the things that help. Thyroid, we already talked. Probably the best thing you can do to help your thyroid is to detox. Serotonin, we already covered, insulin, leptin, HGH. And now lastly, anabolic versus catabolic hormones, that also goes back to the exercise that your body does. So, and I'm sure everybody in here has heard of anabolic steroids. That's what it's doing. It's building muscle. Um, now, it's not building muscle healthy. It, it damages the tendons. It damages the ligaments. It does all these different things. But anabolic hormones will build. Um, you, when you stay in that 6 to 12 minute range, that's when you tend to have the largest release. Um, when you go over that, you can still receive benefit from longer exercise, but not only do you release more cortisol, but you release more catabolic hormones. That's why a marathon runner looks so thin. It's why their, their arms have a little bit of sagginess sometimes because they're holding so much body fat and they're actually, they're, they start to break down the muscle with these catabolic hormones. So you want, to, you want to be careful that you, the point in, in sharing that with this exercise is not that, you know, it might not even be everybody's favorite way to exercise. It might be more enjoyable to do it a little bit different. But the thing is, if you're trying to have a certain body type, if you're trying to lose weight, if you're trying to balance your hormones, the way that you do it makes a huge difference in the effects that you're going to, to have. So now, here's the, I talked a lot about your brainstem tonight. Your brainstem is what regulates the majority of this. It's what, it's what balances all these things out. So here's, when we talk about the curves in the neck, what you're seeing, that's a cadaver section next to a, an x-ray. So if you look in this, and this, this, was, a Nobel, this was a Nobel Peace Prize research um, that they, they figured this out, but if you look, when, the, when you have a normal curvature in your neck, your spinal cord is loose and it's relaxed in that, where it turns from right at the top where it's white right there, that's where your brainstem can extend down into it. It extends down into the bottom two vertebrae, or the, excuse me, the top two vertebrae in your neck. So you can see how nice and open and relaxed that is, how well the signals can work. Can everybody see what happens if you have, well, this is an example of an extreme case, but you see how when that curve is reversed, you see what happens to the spinal cord? Well, now this is over a long period. This is more than 20 years of having this, but they've shown that as your, your curve reverses, or the, the straighter that your neck gets, the more that it stretches your spinal cord, and you can have, your spinal cord can be, the size can be almost halved by having a straight neck. So now if your neck's straight, and you're conti consistently over time, you're trying to do all these other things, if the control center, if the thermostat's broken, if the, if the um, spinal canal is degenerating, you're still gonna have issues. And so that's why it's so important even though you might not be hurting, even though you might be um, you know, feeling better because you've been getting adjusted, the more that you correct this, the, longer, the better your health is going to be. If you look here, right about here is right about where your spine starts. So you can see all these things that affects it. All those hormones are regulated through your brain. And, and specifically, like we talked about, serotonin is the number one thing, the number one hormone that they can regulate. The other thing when we talk about sleep, REM sleep is regulated by your brainstem almost exclusively. So the better the position of your upper neck, the better you're going to sleep, the better your mood has the ability to be. Now, are there other factors? Of course there are. How, but this is the starting point for so many people. Um, so if you are here tonight and you're, you've never been, if you've never had an x-ray, if you've never had your spine checked, that's why you were given a gift certificate. It's to come in to check that out and to actually see what's going on. Um, but for everyone else here, that's why 
um, we talk about maintenance. You know, maintenance after you feel good, after your spine's in a better position, because the longer that you keep it in the better position, the healthier you're going to be, the more your body regulates properly, and um, the better everything goes.